So ever since I made that big video about Steven Universe, which still to this day is making grown men shit their pants. If they regurgitate any points from Louis Orchard's algorithm pleasing but overall pretty horrendous hit piece on the show, or have no legitimate legs to stand on besides memes dunking on it, you can safely tune them out because they don't have the slightest clue of what they're actually talking about. Uh, uh, yes, yes, your anguish sustains me. A common refrain from my audience is to ask me to cover the movie and future. I didn't really bother for a while as nothing was really different. The same core problems that influenced the main show also influenced its two spin-offs, and I really don't want to touch the movie in particular because everyone was acting like it was the greatest musical to ever exist. Hell, a common refrain in the comments of the big video was often, Did you at least like the songs? No! The music is a weird sticking point for a lot of people, and for some, the only reason to watch the show. Which was why I didn't mention the music in the video, because it was the thing people were the most parasocial about, and it wasn't very good. But recently, I've started working on other projects that take a more comedic approach to critique. My mom tells me to look for Professor Oak, and when I go to check the grass, because naturally that is the first place anyone would look. He comes out of my house, so I guess he was hiding in the closet. Are you my dad? But I want that juicy XP, so I barge it into every cabin and beat up everyone's pets like the completely reasonable person I am. I don't have a problem, fuck you. But Kurt's broken his hip and therefore can't help. It's almost like diving headfirst into a well isn't a smart decision, but that's just my opinion. So I brought out Mantine, and looking at his moveset, can you guess which move I decided to use against the Dragon-type Pokémon? That's right, it was Surf! It's alright, I won anyway, no harm done. Anyway, the thing is that Rock is weak to grass, so... Oh fuck, I just remembered, Roxanne's a school teacher. <laughs> this joke was in terrible taste. Hey Lance, it, it, it's off, it's off, it's off, it's off. Throw this phone away, Lois. I join chat out by the grass, and they say they're going to jump over the grass to avoid the Pokemon, something that I naturally encourage because I want to see their face get torn off by a wild beaver. Lily, it's this way. Oh, thanks, Bianca. I wasn't sure, given it's the only way out of the town. Let's take our first steps onto Route 1 together. One, two... I'm so glad we shared in this unforgettable experience together. So this game makes that joke its central plot point. Finally, Pokemon is gonna have a serious examination of itself and the implications of its own aging premise. Uh, <clears throat> I don't like the sound of that cough you just made, Game Freak. And I thought, you know what? Let's slam this one out. Shut a few people up. This is the Steven Universe movie. The movie opens with this grand curtain call while the singer declares that everyone believes in Steven. This already sets the mood because the entire series has been entirely about this one specialist goodest little boy. Which is fine if you happen to like Steven, but as most of you are aware by now, I fucking hate this kid. And now they're singing about how he's the most precious little ubermensch in the galaxy and will save us all and Steven dies for your sins. It's interesting because Steven's supposedly being innately compassionate has only ever been a stated character trait for about two seasons at this point. He was always compassionate, but in a rather tame, typical manner that you just kind of expected from a kid. It was around season four as Steven's attitude started to become more and more flanderized that his compassion became something the show was really drilling into people's heads rather than just demonstrating it. But ironically, this shift happened around the time people started to criticize the way he was written, around about bismuth. Well, goodness, how on earth? Did that happen? Look, the all-loving hero isn't new, but Steven's the first time I've seen where the all-loving hero's compassion is something everyone has to bring up all the fucking time. Like, I consider the poster child for the all-loving hero to be Sora, and even Sora had nuances to that. No way! Anyone from the organization who'd like to be next? It turns out the story is actually being told by White Diamond, who is welcoming Steven in as their newest little colonizer. But then he pulls the rug out from under them on live TV by saying, Nah, I'm gonna go back to Earth and become a debate bro. The Diamonds beg him not to go, in a scene I'm sure was shot directly from Rebecca Sugar's own fantasies. I feel it's worth pointing this out whenever, like, harem anime shit is happening, but Rebecca Sugar is a weeb, and so when you have all these grown women fawning over this little boy that just so happens to have all all the same opinions as Sugar. I, I can't help but feel like we're watching someone's private collection. Come on, just let us adore you. Credit where it's due, Patty, Lisa, and Christine are putting their whole pussy into absolutely atrocious songwriting. If there was ever a redeeming quality of Steven Universe, it's the fact that they waste all, and I mean all, of their fucking money on very talented singers and make them sing just the worst lyrics imaginable. Don't you ever listen to your inner conscience? Oh, I'm sorry, babe, I wasn't listening. What? 
Hell, sometimes they'll waste their money on an expensive singer and have them do nothing. <laughs> hey, did you ever wonder why the animation's so shit? I think we just found why. The diamonds are all like, Steven, we stopped doing fascism, kind of, not really. Please give us head pats. Just watching these monsters beg for the approval of this little white boy who's just become the center of the universe by virtue of his own boring white guyness. Nobody show Rebecca Sugar and to Rin. She might actually die of horny. Steven returns to Earth, where we see Connie again, just before she tells us that she has to go and not be in the movie, which is a damned shame because I quite like Connie. She's the better version of a protagonist by virtue of having revolutionary things like goals, a character arc, noticeably likable character traits, as opposed to Steven, who's just kind of... Actually, wait a minute. I'll hold the phone. Is that a... Is that a nude painting he did with Garnet? Why is that there? No, really, why is that there? Sugar does, like, 2,000 interviews a minute. Why did nobody ask about this? Like, forget Sugar talking about ragtime music she failed to emulate. What the dirty baked apple fuck is with the nude underage Oedipus cherub painting? Like, one, why did you put that there? And two, what is the story reason you used to justify putting it there? Because I would love to hear it. And then we have another musical number that out of all of them is technically the best, entirely because it uses the main theme as a leitmotif, and is about the only instance of a leitmotif in the entire show, because all the character themes, and most of the music actually now that I think about it, are mostly just kind of discordant dance club beats. I mean, most of this song's instrumentals are just that, but occasionally a melody will creep through and that makes it worthy of a fucking prize. Because that's pretty much Steven Universe discourse in a nutshell, isn't it? I mean, the show discovers something ordinary people figured out decades ago, and we applaud it for overcoming its disadvantages. Side note, I love how Steven is just too lazy to walk one kilometer, and so he decides to just teleport to the big donut through Lars's head. Can you imagine having to be this kid's taxi service? Like, what fresh hell is that? I feel bad for Lars for the first time ever. Steven wants to stay blissful and complacent forever, and that's when it's time for the plot to come smashing in like the Kool-Aid man. Um, yes? Damn it, Steven, I told you not to rant about woke culture on Twitter, you doomed us all! The new gem is this sharp, edgy, Sonic the Hedgehog-looking motherfucker who behaves like the Horde's champion encountering Nathanos for the first time after the war. She took you with her, isn't that just... swell? Fucking hell, Lily, you reached hard to make that work. Yeah, I know, I'm proud of myself. Anyway, Spinel starts ranting and raving about how much she hates Steven and Pink Diamond, and then launches into a song about how much she's jealous about all the other characters. A song where everyone just forgets how to fight while she's progressing successfully losing her mind. Garnet makes a half-hearted attempt to hit her and misses. Pearl does nothing and gets flicked. Amethyst just lets herself get... hair wedgied, I think? Then she swings around the lighthouse and- Oh. Oh, that's a bad shot. You made your animators work overtime writing the story again, didn't you? Then Spinel pulls out her weapon and- Oh, okay, I see where this is going. She's got this old cartoon thing going on. I mean, she doesn't do it very well, but, well, I mean, it's Crooniverse. So she's like an old cartoon, so she's gonna pull out, like, this big comedy mallet or, a, like, a hand on a spring, isn't she? And it, that would be cool. It, you know, that would be cool to see in action. Life's on the line, winner takes all, ready or not, let's begin! Generic anime scythe works too, I guess. You know what? I'm not even gonna blame the movie for that. That was on me. I expected too much. At this point, Steven's finally had enough and pulls out his shield. Really, really late on the draw there. But she's pretty powerful. You better have another Mary Sue power to pull out of your ass. She cuts through his shield like a hot knife through butter, and I guess he really can't be destabilized, can he? So good job, Steven, you did have one. Then they get into a tug of war, and then he takes her scythe and cuts her in half. But it turns out Spinel can't be bubbled because she did something to his gem. Well, time to get the hammer, Steven. No, he just takes him inside and stares at them. Weak sauce. And then Greg bursts in and sums up the last five seasons of the show. Who? No idea. Why? No idea. How? I just have no idea what's going on. Well, son, now you know how I feel almost all the time. Pearl tries to regenerate, but she's in an oyster, and it looks like Pearl's been factory reset to her original settings. And then she is erroneously under the assumption that Greg is her new owner and sings a song about him. I am at your eternity. Service, welcome to your new pearl. Turns out all the gems have been hetconned back to the start of their character arc. You know, a simpler time when space fascism was just an implication, Pearl was an anime trope, and the artist hadn't quite figured out how to draw a resting facial expression. Then Spinel comes back, and she's gone from being a cross between Jenny Wakeman, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Sylvanas Windrunner, to just being Minnie Mouse if she were a Pokemon. She's been factory reset as well, which means there was nobody to tell them what kind of load the big space penis is shooting into the Earth. Steven eventually realizes that Bismuth, Lapis, and Peridot are still unharmed and can still help, but they don't really know much about it either. Here's she is my new best friend, Spinel. A 
pleasure to meet you all. I thought you said she was just trying to kill you. Oh, Bismuth, that was a whole 12 seconds ago. We gotta stop dwelling in the past. Bismuth explains that the weapons used to reset gems to being back to how they made them. Homeworld used them to essentially mind control gems who started having silly ideas about free will and sex. So all their character development has been wound back to zero, except for Steven, who was already there. Steven starts to realize that his powers are reset, everyone's in trouble, and nobody knows what to do. And then he looks at Ruby and Sapphire and laments that he wishes Garnet were here. And to my surprise, they actually very faintly play the melody to Stronger Than You in the background, which is about the second time they've done this in the entire series. I was, I was quite surprised here. That was a good musical thing you did, Kroonover. You get it, thicker. Then Steven sings a Linkin Park song, and the entire time this is going on, Sapphire's just standing there, staring off into space, while Ruby goose steps around her. Fucking queens. They decide the best way to get them to refuse is liberal applications of violence. Well, geez, Steven, where the fuck was that when Rudolph Hess almost crushed your damn skull? He can't go through with it, but then Spinel picks up the edgy pizza cutter and jackhammers her way across the land. The entire time this is going on, Sapphire's predicting everything, Ruby's gushing about how cool she is, and Sapphire's blushing like a gay idiot. This is something Steven Universe always gets right. When Ruby and Sapphire are on screen, the story grinds to a halt for quality sapphic nonsense. An anvil drops on Ruby's head, and Sapphire pushes her out of the way, causing them to fuse back into Garnet, and they fall in love at first sight. Unfortunately, it's not even halfway through the movie yet, so Steven's hasty solution turns out not to work. Garnet doesn't remember jack shit, and it looks like her entire brain's fallen out as well. Well, what's going on? But it looks like she's doing a pretty good job watching herself. Why are you fighting? Aren't we all friends? Oh, what's this? Garnet, don't, don't touch that! <laughs> and then Greg shows up with his J.C. Penny looking Gardevoir and tells Steven that Amethyst is missing. Benel wants to come too, but Steven wants her to stay there, but then she has a little bit of a Gollum moment. You stay here with the others, and I'll be right back. No! Okay, she's faking it, got it. They find Amethyst in Vidalia's weird garage of paintings of her. If you didn't see the early seasons, these two had like this weird romantic tension the show never did anything with. Time is fucked with people's brains, but the early seasons of Steven Universe were actually pretty good. But over time, a lot of the good writers and animators left over creative differences with the showrunner. Then they sing a song and speed run an entire show's worth of character development, casually forgetting the point where they just hard reset Amethyst's entire character and started from scratch, but don't worry about it. Then they rush back to the space penis to find that it's making the land turn all weird bully wobbly and we get an actually funny line. Amethyst, get away from me. I can't stand to see you all vacant and bereft of personality. Yo, I'm back, you dip. You know, Michaela Dice just gives the best dry wit. Turns out the space penis is coming poison that will destroy all organic life on Earth. Steven tries to lift it out, but it's not the end of the movie yet, so his Mary Sue powers won't work. Spinel's the only one who can get the space penis to pull out, but they don't know how to system restore her back to before she was reset. Except Pearl. Pearl might, but she's still busy doing orientation play with Greg, so that's a problem. Turns out the key to fixing Pearl is that they need to recreate what happened between her and Pink Diamond, but with Greg instead. Yeah, this is a casual reminder, uh, Pearl is gay. I feel someone writing the movie forgot that at some point. It's okay, it's Crewniverse, they get a gold star if they manage to tie their shoes by themselves. But it turns out that trying to recreate this doesn't seem to be working, so Amethyst pulls a drastic move and shapeshifts into Stella Kubler. But that still doesn't work, and she just keeps staring at Greg. Okay, uh, I've been doing the conversion jokes for a little bit now, but honestly, it's a little creepy that they've gone with this bit for this fucking long, uh, and I am officially out of jokes, so please end this. But then Steven has an idea. Pearl's big moment of character development came after Rose committed suicide, so all he has to do is take Greg out of existence by capping him in the head, I mean fusing with him. Now, there's concept art out there of a Steven-Greg fusion where he's this kind of grungy dad rock guy with a, like a spiked mohawk that's actually one of the coolest of Steven's fusion designs. Kind of reminds me of my dad, the rock star now that I think about it. But in the end, they didn't go with that. Uh, they decided instead to go with the single most boring fucking design they've ever thought of. This thing looks like it was designed by Rob Liefeld with a hairstyle that looks like the 60s were compensating for something other than paranoia about communism. And you remember how I said, please end this joke? Uh, yeah, they don't. What do you want to do? I put up with that bit for way too long. Fuck off, Becky. That wasn't cute or funny. It was just creepy and weird. Even by your weeby, frow-angled, dick-riding standards. Just... Just fuck off. Anyway, after they finish... 
Pearl, Steven's dying bleeding on the carpet, and Spinel runs off. After getting an explanation that Spinel used to be Pink Diamond's Curlia, Steven insists on running off alone, much to the chagrin of everyone around him, because Steven has a martyr complex at this point. There's this thing in this movie and future after it where Steven's insistence on diving into danger is shown to be damaging his psyche, but all that is undercut by the fact that the show has so far glorified him doing this up until this point. Granted, I'm not 100% against this, I'm no stranger to making my writing fuck-ups look like something I meant to do this entire time, but given the fact that the show has so far centered entirely around this white boy talking down to women, people of color, and victims of tyrannical oppression, maybe someone else should do this. How about Pearl? You know, the other person Pink Diamond thoroughly abused and treated like garbage. Just a thought. Oh yeah, I jumped the gun. Spinelli used to be a playmate for Pink Diamond until Pink got bored of her and ordered her to stay there and not move a muscle while she ran off to go play with her new slave. And Pink Diamond has done some fucked up shit throughout her three identities in this show, but I think this one's the most brazenly sadistic. She leaves so many characters in nihilistic despair. She had this playmate that she treated like dog shit, she had a slave who she treated like... I guess it doesn't really matter how you treat a slave, you still have a slave. Still, having said that, I feel guilty. She started a rebellion and didn't have it stand for anything or have any teeth and got all of her loyal soldiers corrupted, and she just up and committed suicide for the sake of this fucking kid and left all of her friends grieving and aimless. At the start of the show, Rose is this inspiring figure with regrets who still strikes hope in people, and now here's yet another person driven to suicidal nihilistic despair at the mere mention of her name. Okay, you know characters like Amon or Getsis, you know, revolutionaries who clearly stand for something, but the writers were just too rich or white to even dare challenge the status quo, and so they hastily backpedal into writing them as power-hungry liars. Rose is kind of like that, except it's all backstory and no point. Not even a shitty conservative point, it's, it's, there's just no point. The idea is interesting on paper, uncovering the bloody despicable legacy of your parents, I mean Steven is basically Rolf Mengele meeting one of the children his father experimented on, but the problem is that it's being done by fucking Kruniverse, whose entire creative well is filled only with bad anime and racist cartoons, complete with the most Amateur Hour attempted a musical because Sugar is absolutely committed to not giving it a rest with that shit. So we've got this mixture of, ooh, ooh everyone deserves a second chance, kindergarten rhetoric, smacked right next to the suicidal despair of a person who was treated like a disposable object by an actual monster and is coming to terms with the fact that it was never loved. And after all of that, that tear-rending confession of all the pain Spinel has endured, the next words out of Steven's mouth are, I am shocked. Shocked! Well, not that shocked. I have never more wanted to grab this fucking franchise by its neck and yell, FIGURE OUT YOUR FUCKING TONE! Are you a show for babies about forgiveness, or are you a show for teenagers about abuse and suicidal despair? Pick a lane, you edgy, talentless weeb. I feel like I'm reading that one My Little Pony fanfic where Pinkie Pie disembowels someone, only this time the writer's actually trying to make it a serious work of drama. We're trying to have a serious talk about abandonment issues in a show where one episode prior we redeemed a Nazi general with a sick burn. This is the problem with Steven Universe as a whole. There's a lot of solid ideas, really, a lot of solid ideas. Like, all of them could work in a vacuum, but they never build on any of them because the showrunner gets distracted with another one before they can finish the first one. And when they do, they execute them in the most weird ways possible. You remember the rebellion for individuality and freedom? Over the course of the show, the rebellion is increasingly invalidated to the point it was basically Pink Diamond's sick joke. Remember how Shattering Gems was this big line that was too far to cross because it was clearly a fate worse than death? Well, it turns out you can repair Shattered Gems very very easily, rendering all that drama, tension, and weight completely and utterly fucking moot. People point this out to me when I call the diamonds genocidal, that they can actually repair shattered gems, and they say this as a gotcha because it was written specifically to be one, to the people pointing out that a random instant redemption for genocidal tyrants was kind of disgusting. But they don't realize that they're admitting that the drama and tension of half the show is being completely and utterly destroyed for the sake of a take that at people who are only going to laugh at you even more than they already are. Anyway. Steven gives Spinel his usual oo-woo pep talk, and Spinel agrees to come back and stop the injector. But Steven gets too wrapped up in preserving his perfect moment from earlier that day, and so Spinel starts to think that maybe Steven was bullshitting her. And you know what? 
I like this scene. I know I just got done ripping my hair out over the jagged, freaked out tone, but having Spinel start to freak out again because Steven is a selfish prick is great. Spinel starts to panic and is afraid that she's going to be put away somewhere and left alone again. And Steven keeps babbling that it's not what he meant until he trips over and drops the hard reset keyblade. And then Spinel starts to think that he's going to reset her again. All of this because his what next plans conveniently ignored Spinel. And you know, there's an easy solution to that. Steven could just stop, take a deep breath and say, you're right. I'm sorry, I should have picked my words better, we're not going to abandon you, but getting Garnet and me sorted out is very important. Sure, Steven largely misspoke and isn't technically in the wrong, but apologizing anyway would calm Spinel down, and it would actually be very touching, a sign that Steven has been paying attention to everything Spinel has been saying. But instead, he stammers and stands there like an anime character trying to make a decision while Spinel rapidly escalates. Just give her the scythe. Like, that would be an knowledge base. Give her the scythe. I'm not even complaining here. It's to be expected. This is an unintentional commentary on Steven's behavior. Steven's compassion is very weak. It's very self-serving. It's less about helping people as it is about affirming his own ego as a good person. This was even the case with Bismuth, where Steven wasn't really concerned with being right, and then he was concerned with being better than someone. So the show doesn't really unpack his ignorance or behavior, it endorses them instead. Even the sequel series was less about unpacking his character as it was all the shit he's been through, because his behavior is not something the showrunners consider a problem, even though it is. So Spinel decides to reactivate the injector and destroy the Earth, and takes Garnet hostage, and it gets a little weird. Garnet's been written as an airheaded ditz the moment they fused in this film, and that probably would have been funny in a vacuum, but the show has had a history of treating Garnet with either scorn, derision, or voyeur. So I can't take the whole villain speech seriously because this frame here, this is just Becky getting ready to write a Garnet episode on a day ending and why. Steven snaps the scythe in half and that causes Garnet to suddenly get her memories back along with her visor, meaning she can no longer make a facial expression. They decide they have to stop Spinel, no shit guys, but Steven puts them on rescue duty so they don't steal his glory. Steven can't fight but he's gonna try talking to her because if at first you don't succeed, keep copying that one Naruto trope until the credits roll. And we also learn that Beach City doesn't have emergency services apparently. Does the Earth just have, like, nothing? Spinel holds him over a chasm and says that now that she knows Steven personally, she wants to kill him even more than she did that morning. Which is understandable, if you knew someone like Steven in real life, you'd want to bash his head in with a pipe wrench. Steven openly wonders why his powers aren't back, despite the fact that he's right back where he started. But then he realizes that his powers grew because he grew, and learned from all his horrible experiences. Which, if you've watched the entire show, you will know that statement is not canon. But I guess there was an interview or something where Sugar said he got woke at some point. Carry on. He magically gets all of his powers back and fights Spinel while singing a youth pastor song about faith. And of all of his powers he's gotten back, one of them is his mother's ability to implant unconscious suggestion in people. If you've wondered how Steven can have so much success with talking the monster down, one of his mother's powers is literally mind control. And the mind control works as Spinel breaks down into tears, the space penis explodes, Steven declares that there's no such thing as a happily ever after, just in time to go through his emo phase, starts eating dirt, and then has a conversation with Spinel about friendship just as the diamonds land on the planet. Honestly, I am so happy to see the diamonds, because after all of that ill-fitting angst, all of that fake drama, all those weird no more lies parallels, just seeing these three cringe ass psychopaths was the kind of levity I needed. If they ever bring the show back, every episode needs to end with a reminder that these three were a decision the show made. The show could do with a little self-awareness of its mistakes instead of constantly trying to act like it never makes them. Hell, White Diamond walks off giving the boomer mom guilt trip. That's fucking hilarious. Then Steven has the idea to pawn Spinel off on the diamonds, sending her off into space to never see her again, all while the diamonds are singing their crappy Doki Doki literature club song about their empty nest syndrome, as all four of them cling to ghosts and will never get any better, basically doing the same thing Pearl did. Because it wouldn't be Steven Universe if the characters involved didn't learn absolutely nothing. Next season, Steven turns into a kaiju because his 12-year-old girlfriend refuses to marry him. And that was the movie. It wasn't very good. Okay, so to come down from hijinks, the reason I never covered this when it was out was because I watched it and found there was nothing really new to say. I only agreed to do it now because my perspective on Steven Universe and its creator has shifted from sanctimonious centrist to this is what Tommy Wiseau would make if he were a weeb and also obsessed with Hamilton. So it did warrant talking about the show again. All in all, it's just more of the same. If you didn't already like Steven Universe, the movie wasn't going to change that. The movie was the exact same set of tropes done in the exact same way as the show. Pink Diamond has a secret other victim 
victim, there's a new villain who wants to commit genocide, Steven fixes it with a martyr complex and a speech about change, really good singers sing the worst lyrics you can possibly imagine, something creepy happens with Garnet, and the tone bounds back and forth between comedy and drama like Sonic the Hedgehog trying to justify its existence to an aging fanbase. Steven Universe has always carried the stink of the auteur, a pet project, something made for the creator's sake rather than the viewer's. It carries the signs of constantly switching to new ideas, overindulgently trying to do everything in one career-defining masterpiece, rather than picking a few solid ideas and sticking with them. Sugar was piling all of her inspirations from anime she watched as a kid, and then all of the other random ideas they had during production, and crammed them all together even if they didn't really work. We even see in this very movie that good and clever ideas were ultimately shunted aside for more self-indulgent anime references. Now this happens in other mediums all the time, especially video games. We've all heard of John Romero, Robert Poloni, and 3D Realms. Hell, we've all heard of Star Citizen, but it's not often it happens in an episodic TV show because usually the executives jump in to say, okay, somebody's gotta stop wasting our fucking money. And that is admittedly what happened. Sugar was told in 2016 that the show would only get five seasons, and for those wondering, 2016 was around season two and three. But not quite, because not only were they given far more advanced than most people get, they also got a movie and a sequel series on top of that. That's a weird way to cancel a show, Cartoon Network. I will confess that out of all the shows I've covered, Steven Universe is the most fascinating to talk about, because the problems it has are unusual for any show, animated or not. Stans generally try to cope by redirecting blame for any complaints away from the executive producer, tacitly ignoring the fact that letting rogue staff members just do terrible shit without oversight is also a condemnation of the showrunner. I guess this is why people still like talking about The Room, or why there's 500 videos about the guy who makes the crazy stalking murderer game, because there's a fascination with turning over a rock and discovering the dark truths behind the creator. But honestly, I don't really think there's some dark truth to Rebecca Sugar. I think the truth is pretty tame and boring. When your main inspiration is Utena, and you sit down to write a lesbian relationship, guess what it's gonna look like? And that's it. It's not really any deeper than that. Weeb didn't know what they were doing. In other news, the sky is blue and a debate bro is screaming racial slurs. Bye bye